Um, good afternoon. My name is Sheila Lamb, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 26 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one advising services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Cybersecurity Training, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network. We are recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box, and we will address them at the end of the session. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can sh show, I'm sorry, or hide via your own <laughs> meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session, Kiana Ganey. Kiana is a 20 plus year IT and cybersecurity industry veteran and has served as Chief Executive Officer for Secure Tech 360 located in Springfield, Virginia since its inception in 2010. She is also the Cyber Industry Specialist for the Virginia SBDC. Welcome, Kiana. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome everyone to cybersecurity training. We'll just dive right in. Um, today we'll cover a few things. I'll talk a little bit about the importance of cybersecurity training and give you some tips and tricks on how to put together a program for your organization and then give you some links to be able to do some additional research or even add on some different things that we talk about today. Next slide. Um, so again, I'm um, going to go over a little bit about cybersecurity training. We're going to talk about some uh, key messages and behaviors that you want to make sure that you are addressing in your cybersecurity training to your employees. We're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite months, which is October, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. There's a lot of events and training that you can take advantage of as a small business owner. And then you can either host some events or even, you know, contact some organizations like um, CISA. And then we'll wrap up with some questions and we'll give you some contact information at the end. Next slide. So a little bit about myself, um, I'm, I'm too also a, a small business owner. Um, I've been in the industry about 20 years. Um, I'm also an Air Force veteran, so I'm very proud. So anyone that's a veteran on this call, thank you for your service as well. Um, but I'm truly excited about this role as the cybersecurity small business advisor. It gives me an opportunity to be able to speak to other small business owners and help them navigate this wonderful world of cybersecurity. Next slide. So um, in today's session, we will explore a few uh, in user education and talk about the importance about it. And then we'll talk about some things that are happening um, in the world of cybersecurity for 2023 and beyond. And then also give you some strategies to be able to discuss and also highlight those in your cybersecurity training with your end users. Um, so one thing I wanna just highlight, um, when you're developing your cybersecurity training for your organization, um, I'll just give you a couple of quick tips from even my own organization. Um, when you're doing onboarding with your HR processes, make sure that you have something that highlights how you want the technology that you are will be using for with your employees or your employees will be using to service your customers, what that will look like. And that could just be a simple one pager um, and then also, I even have my employees do a cybersecurity pledge so they can highlight their commitment to cybersecurity and then also highlighting some, some key components that are, is, is, that are relevant to our industry, but also relevant to our customers and then to our organization as well. And then we definitely talk a lot about incident response and management. I mean, with everything going on in the world, every day there's a new something making sure that you are prepared. I always say prevention is the best cure um, and so that you don't spend money on the, the flip end trying to figure out what to do when an emergency happens. And then also putting together an incident response plan and also training, doing at least an initial training and annual training. And then if there's something that happens in between, also doing some lessons learned so that you can continue to keep the conversation going. And then also putting together some type of risk assessment based on your industry and needs. So making sure you understand 
If you're in the financial sector, what does that look like? What do those risks look like, right? What are those potential dangers? What are those areas that you can either do for enhancement? So it's all about making sure that you're proactive. And then if you're using um, a network of some sort, right? Um, making sure you have certain defensive measure, measures in place. That could be anything from a firewall or um, multi-factor authentication, that's very popular now, or making sure that if you do, are you using any type of technology, how are you using those with the best practices for that organization? And then also creating a contingency plan or, that will establish communication protocol. So um, in, if anyone that's in the military, we used to have a thing that called, was called a recall roster, but we would put together a list of personnel that were essential, and then also clients and vendors that if in the event that something happened, that there will be a process of how we will call, when we will call, and then that will be in a, a, a document that we would actually print out and put in a safe space, right? I know we utilize a lot of technology, but there are certain things that you can put aside that in an emergency, you can have that as a backup because sometimes the emergency may be that there is no technology, right? So just making sure you're putting together uh, cybersecurity end user training that encompass all these things are very key to your success. Next slide. So again, we talked about some key messaging, right? Making sure that you have crucial cybersecurity practices in place, everything from password management, and it could be something as simple as changing your password every 30 days, what, what would be the length of those passwords, making sure you put together some type of schedule to do software updates. I know I see the button that says uh, update is due and making sure you're doing that, you know, regularly because there are a lot of different updates that are, that will be key to keeping your infrastructures very safe. Um, and then making sure that you have some type of detection or reporting process in place to help with things like phishing attacks or um, different type of met mechanisms that attackers are using to try to infiltrate your, your infrastructure. And then making sure that there's a widespread adoption. And I always say that it, start, it starts with the leadership. Um, making sure that your employees understand that you're just as committed to cybersecurity and making sure that the infrastructure is, is safe and secure. And keeping that in your regular uh, staff meetings, I make sure that even in my staff meetings, we do some type of cybersecurity update or we talk about things that are going on in the current environment. And we look at ways that we can either do things differently. And then also outside of cybersecurity, making sure that you're having your physical security mechanism in place as well. So if you're in a building of some sort, making sure you have somewhere where users can sign in and out and making sure that there's a process about that. And then educating the maybe the front desk person that works there about how you want your organization to be secure and how you want to do access to your information and even to your, your actual physical location. And then also attending wonderful workshops like this. This is a great tool to be able to increase that conversation or your knowledge base about what is the latest that's going on in cybersecurity. And also, you know, taking that information and looking at what do you currently have in place now and see if there's ways that you can enhance it. So being, you know, having active engagement. Um, I do, a, I follow a lot of cybersecurity uh, government agencies because even on their social media platforms, they're always putting out different informations and tips and tools about how you can stay safe as a small business owner or even just in general, right? So making sure that you're active in the community and active in the engagement. And then sometimes if there's an opportunity to ask a question, ask a question, right? So the more you know, the more it it'll benefit you and your end users and even your organization as a whole. And then building a strong culture that establishes cybersecurity training, those protocols, how to recognize risk, um, how to report those risks, what to do in the, in the in the event of an emergency or just a, an incident, how do you handle those things? Having a written, um, uh, written uh, plan definitely helps you be able to navigate um, during those, those tumultuous times. And then again, we talked about just staying up to date on the latest cybersecurity trends and incidents, because that also will heighten your state of awareness. Uh, I start my day uh, watching the, the, the daily news and watching a few other uh, periodicals that talk about what's going on in our environment so that I can understand what the, what the days will look like, right? Because we are in a constant change every day. There's something else happening. There's always these emerging threats. And so being, 
you know, staying on top of those things would help you be able to be agile, but also help you to respond to threats and then also create um, content that you can also share with your, your, your end users and also with your employees. Next slide. So again, um, as we're approaching the fall, we're, we're leaving the summer and I know I'm always kind of getting the summer blues, but fall is actually one of my favorite times of the year. And one of the greatest, one thing that comes out in October outside of Halloween is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And what I love about um, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is that they have a, a plethora of, of events and information um, all about promoting what we're talking about today, um, cybersecurity and um, how to you know, navigate this digital landscape, how to um, you know, implement and be, re be responsible cybersecurity citizens that like to call us and also implementing some of those best practices. Um, there's a National Cybersecurity Alliance that helps with engaging, um, that puts out a lot of content. They have campaigns that promote the awareness. So if you can attend one, I know as a small business owner, our time is very limited, but these type of events also will help you be able to navigate um, upcoming threats or things that are, you know, that's always coming up. There's always things that are changing. And with the digital age that we live in, new technologies are always on the rise. So making sure you understand what those new technologies will bring will also help you as a small business owner, but also be able to educate your end users in your community so that you can keep that communication going. And then also, if you have the capacity, host an event, right? We want you to be a part of it um, so that we can all be, you know, we all can navigate this together. I always say we're stronger in numbers and information is key and it's, it gives us power to be able to help navigate the different, ch the changing of the digital age, right? It's always something that's going on. Um, it also helps you if you have a subject matter expert or you know, a guest speaker that you want to bring in where you say, you know, cyber's not my thing. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I do finance. It's not really my thing. You know, it's nothing wrong with looking for a subject matter expert. Um, we have some wonderful um, events that's coming up with Virginia SBDC as well. Um, we also have, a, you have the, you have us as a, as a tool that you can always reach out to see if you want us to help in any matter that we can, because there's a lot of information you may want to put together. And if you have you know, training slides or you have training ideas and you want to kind of bounce them around, we're here to help you. So making sure that you utilize the community that's there to support you will help a major impact with making sure that you stay in secure outside of October and beyond. Next slide. So again, we talked about, you know, attending these conferences, um, contacting some of these agencies. One of my favorite is CISA right now. They have uh, partnership opportunities, especially during uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. They have um, a plethora of information on their West website. They give you uh, tools and tips about how to report any cybersecurity issues or incidents. And we talked about having an incident response plan. So the more you know, you can put together a, a, a great plan for your organization. And then you can utilize a lot of the information because as, as the latest trends and updates and advancements are happening, they have a lot of industry professionals and experts to help you, you know, help you gain valuable insights and knowledge to be able to enhance and create a, a wonderful cybersecurity program and training for you, for yourself, and then also for your end users in your, in your community. Next slide. So in conclusion, I know I kind of did a deep dive really fast about cybersecurity training and why it's so vital that we live in an age where we're in a digital age, especially with 2023, we have a lot of advancement in technology. And, and although technology has fostered great advancements for our communities, it also has created some additional risks. So making sure that we understand and using best practices when it comes to cybersecurity, I like to say that cybersecurity for technology is a perfect marriage. When you bridge them together, and you put an emphasis on collaborative learning experiences, also making sure that it's a part of your day-to-day -day operations, that we are discussing incident response, that we understand what risks we are encountering for any type of clients or customers that we use, um, making sure that our networks have the best defenses, making sure we understand what to do in emergencies, and then creating a, a pathway to be able to understand the involving 
cyber threats that are that are among us, right? It's not going anywhere. So the only thing we can do is make sure that we're educated, that we're empowered, and that we're prepared, right? I always like to say prevention is better than a cure. So here's a couple of links and resources um, for you to be able to kind of do a, a, a deeper dive. There's a lot of great services and tools and um, there's everything from YouTube videos, there's everything from what, how to report, when to report, um, when to escalate, if, there's a, if you need to escalate to other organizations outside of yourself, there is a lot of information out there. So embrace cybersecurity. And I hope that this just gives you enough information to at least get started. And I would say it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could be as simple as a PowerPoint presentation I would put together. It could be as simple as a few slides that just highlights some specific things that are unique to your organization that you want your end users and customers to understand about your environment. And then it could just be as simple as you just, you know, highlighting maybe your staff meetings or all hands meetings that you just keep the conversation going. I think that the more that they see leadership and management embracing cybersecurity, it's, you know, it, it promotes a culture that your employees feel one, empowered, Two, they have education and they, you know, an informed user is the, one of the best users. Next slide. So any questions? I know I went through a lot. One pop up. Um, one moment. Are there any specific devices or software you would recommend to secure a small business network? So depending on uh, your customers and your clients, I always say I'm, I'm very leery about giving one specific uh, tool because it's very, it, it, it depends on what you're trying to secure, what type of data you are um, processing. Um, and it depends on, you know, what is in your, your environment, right? So um, if you're using certain products um, and, and, and there's a lot of information or a lot of things within that product that you're using that you can you know, secure that device or that application. So I always say start there first because that at least gives you a, a level of protection. So if you have a network and it's completely open and you, you've never changed it from what the Comcast router was, you know, you can just start as simple as that, right? Change the router name, you know, put together a strong password that is not something that was given to you by the Comcast, you know, die technician that, that, that dropped off the device, right? It could be something as simple as that. Um, if you're using um, laptops, you know, depending on what type of data you're using. I've seen, you know, some people use, uh, you know, enc they encrypt the actual laptop. So in the event that something happens, that they're able to either do a remote wipe for, you know, to make sure that the information that's on that laptop is not spread or can be accessed, right? Or you can do as simple as if you have an iPad and there's an opportunity for you to put a code on the iPad and not leaving it open. You know, it's just small things that we can do to keep ourselves secure and then making sure that if we do purchase any new technology, I always say, look underneath that hood, read all the terms and conditions, read the privacy policies and see what type of best practices are available for that particular device or application and whatever information. A lot of times you'll find that some of the uh, manufacturers that put together these devices will also have a cheat sheet or some type of security best practices. Read them, implement them. Don't make it so stringent to you lock yourself out or you have to do things like write down your password and now it, that is also create a new risk. So don't make it so stringent to where you're presenting new risks to yourself, but don't make it so you know open that anybody can access it. So that would be my advice. Um, let's see, I am not CMMC certified. What is the best route to do so in case DCMA does an audit? So there is an organization called Project Spectrum um, and it's, they have a, a, an assessment tool that will help you with each getting the CMC level one and level two, depending on you know, what agency organization that you are servicing. Um, 
I had to just go through this process for myself because some of my government, I do a lot of government contracting as well. And I found that it was a great resource. There are several ones out there on the market, but that's one that I've used myself and I've heard some great things from just, you know, the industry itself. So I would start there. Um, and, and they have a plethora of information on their website. Um, if you are using a third party processor, such as Square, PayPal, et cetera, is cybersecurity their responsibility? Uh, what would the backup plan be for a small business? Oh my goodness, a great question. So we talked about this a little bit in the last first question. Read the terms of terms and conditions, the privacy policy, because there you will find the legal language that that third party is either saying you're responsible for or they're responsible for, right? And so either one or two things, you will have to create your own data protection policy, data user policy, right? And then you have to think about where their, their security ends and where your start, right? Every, every application, device, third-party vendor, um, there is a certain level of responsibility, but once something like, just like with your phone, once it's handed off to you, you have to do your due diligence to make sure as the person that's using said device application, read the privacy policy, read the terms of conditions. You will find out a lot of how your information is being used, what, how their data is being stored. Um, and, and, and that will give you enough information for you to make a decision on how you wanna use those, that particular application device in your, in your um, organization or environment. But please re read the fine print, read the fine print. Um, this is a follow-up to the earlier question. What is the most affordable way to become CMMC certified? Um, so that's a great question. Um, and depending on your budget, right, um, and even your potential client needs to be able to get that certification, that's usually some type of decision that you can make by looking at, you know, what will be the best practice for you. Um some of the, the requirements in the CMC is just things like putting together cybersecurity training, right? That's one thing that was on the list. Um, it could be implementing some form of um, data protection policy. So there are things that you can put in place that are affordable that you can just probably get some templates, um, you know, utilize, um, uh, and in user training, like putting together like an initial in user training, final and showing a way that you can track that training. Um, there's things that you can do that are that won't cost you a lot, but just re go to the website. They have like a, a risk assessment there and some information about how to get started. And then even one of our partners, um, Posture, that's on our Virginia SPDC. They also have a great tool in there that can put together some great templates that you can use that you don't have to pay um, someone to put together for you, right? So I know it's, it's like another expense um, and there were some things you may have to pay out of pocket and then there's some things that you can probably do on your own. So it's kind of that, I always say it's that as a small business owner, you gotta kind of balance out what's, what works best for you. If it's getting the certification so that you can probably you know scale your business and make more money, you know maybe you have to put up some upfront costs and then on the back end can, make up that cost later on. So that's kind of a decision you have to make as a small business owner. Um, what about securing medical related data that should be protected by HIPAA? Are there any recommendations for tools and processes to implement? Yes. So when you're dealing with any type of sensitive data, right? Um, making sure that I always say, think about sensitive data, just like you would think about your own medical records, right? You wouldn't just have that open to just the general public. You will make you want you would be upset if you walked into a medical office and they had your medical history or your file just sitting out, right? So think about that in reverse. So if you're the one that's capturing the data and there's security control that you can put into place, like making sure that you're you know backing up that information to an encrypted folder where you only have limited access to certain users that need have a need to know, right? That's one thing that also has certain type of privileges and usage of that data, making sure that you understand what the retention is for said data. So is it, 
you know, deleting the record after 30 days? Is it backing it up into a, another place where it's not in one place? So you have to look at so many different things when you're when you're dealing with HIPAA data, or you're dealing with medical data, or any type of sensitive data, right? So this is where the cybersecurity education for your end users is so important. When we talked about making sure you understand the risks involved with the information that you have in your that you're responsible for, right? Making sure that the, the person or the, the users in your environment or even your own employees handling the data understand what that looks like. So and making sure that even upon them first being hired and then maybe even as things are changing, that you make sure that the, that information, that end user training is updated so that you have the most up-to-date and information on how you can protect that data. Um, we have someone asking what the answer was for the Square and PayPal question. Can you just do a quick synopsis of your response about how to protect yourself um, with those systems, please? So I don't, so th that's why it's very important for you to read the terms and conditions and the privacy policies for either, you know, third party vendors like Square. They have a lot of information on how their information, how your information is being protected. Um, and then from there, you may have to develop some additional policies for yourself, right? Because they're they're only going to they're going to lay out because by law they have to lay out how that information is protected, how your data is being protected, right? They'll give you the terms of use. So there is some risk involved when you're using any type of third party application. So the the most the best uh, way you can prevent any 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 the best way you can prevent anything is making sure you read the fine print, right? Um, and because it, and it's always changing. So again, it's always changing. So even if you put it like a, a reminder for yourself, if that is the main consistent way that you probably process, you know, payments for your clients and customers, put a process in place that every 30 days you go out and you read those terms and conditions and privacy policies to make sure something hasn't been updated and make sure that you're still being protected. Um, how can CISA help your business? Are they a value, an evaluator of your business info systems and practices? No. So they're just a resource, very similar to a training that you attended today. So they will have tips. They will have um, events where they bring in additional subject matter experts that may have specific um, industries, like maybe someone that's just dealing with healthcare, maybe someone that's dealing with the financial sector. And then they also have a lot of practical best practices and then some other techniques and things that we talked about, like a template on how to deal with the incident response or who to contact, when should you get the FBI involved, when should you get local law for enforcement involved. So they just have a plethora of information that you can utilize to be able to implement in your own end user cybersecurity training and then also being able as a small business owner, using some of those resources to keep yourself informed. So it's more of a resource, um, not necessarily like they don't have, you know, professionals that will help you with your specific business. It's there to help in general, um, any small business owner or anyone really that's, um, that's using any type of technology to understand how to navigate um, this ever-changing digital um, landscape, right? Every day there's something else. Um, I have a new virtual assist small business, um, currently has a basic home malware virus coverage. Do you recommend additional malware to protect my client's big data? So the, again, this is where we talked about assessing the risk and threats for your, your potential client. If you're using data that has sensitive information, like we talked about with the medical records or maybe financial records, and you have something like a malware or you have um, malware protection or antivirus protection? Um, do you have a firewall in place? Do you use multi-factor authentication? You know, what else do you have in your environment to be able to have some certain security controls in, in place, right? So always, always think about like a house. Only person that understands what's valuable in your house is you, right? So depending on the actual homeowner, they know what valuables are inside of the house. So they may go get a dog. They may go and get an extra gate. They may put bars on their window. They may get an alarm system. They may that outsource to ADT, or maybe they have a ring camera so they can see people delivering their packages, right? So as your business is growing, 
and you're starting to process sensitive data or any type of data that's probably outside of you and you're using third-party applications like we talked about with like the squares and you're using all these different types of things. The best thing you can do as a small business owner is to make sure you assess those risks, that you put together a plan, that you understand the technology that's being used in your environment and that you document that and then you continuously look for updates for any type of technology application or device that you're using because they're always changing, right? So malware may have been the only protection you need when it was probably you and one other person, but now that you're introducing, anytime you introduce anything new into your environment, that is a, a great time to look underneath the hood, right? If you put your car to be serviced and they put on something new, like new tires, before they release that car back out to you, they're gonna test drive that car. They're gonna make sure there's no additional recalls, right? Because they don't want you to leave out of there and then something happens, right? It's the same concept with cybersecurity. I try to make it as practical as that. So anytime that you're introducing something new to your environment, take the time to educate yourself about it. Um, how would you suggest we develop a strong ongoing annual program of cybersecurity as a small business? without overbearing our staff and colleagues? Um, how may we keep it interesting and challenging without becoming burdensome from your experience? So from my experience, I, I because I'm in the cyber business, maybe I, it's fun to me, but I know for some other people, it's like going to the, the dentist and he's telling you, you need a root canal today. You're like, I know I need it, but it's not fun. Make it fun though, right? So it's like, you can put together something that is either a video, like for us, we did a, a video and in the video, we talk about you know the different risks and threats that we are constantly facing for our customers and clients. And then we also put together a PowerPoint and then we, we mention it or we talk about it in our, our weekly staff meetings. So it's an ongoing conversation. So it's not something that seems like, you know how you get, and I, and I know I'm guilty. I've worked for organizations and they give you the annual cybersecurity training and you're like, hitting the next button. You're like, yep, that looks right. Yep, that looks right. And it's not fun. It's not interactive. You're not connecting with it. You know, find a way to make it interesting, right? You know your employees the best. You know how they, how you can deliver information to them that can make it fun and exciting. So put together something that you know that they will be engaged in. And that's something that they will be feel empowered because you want them to be empowered because they are the first line of defense. 90% of cybersecurity incidents happen because of lack of um, education. The, the, the users are in users or the person that usually is involved in an incident. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know who to call. They didn't know, you know, they didn't know how to even get started, right? So imagine that, and that's not something that's just for small business. That is over, over all, I've seen Fortune 500 companies struggle with this. So understanding that that's why that's why it's so important to put together a cybersecurity education plan and make it fun you know we don't have to make it like we're going to get a root canal every time we talk about it um same persons this is a follow-up to the question um how may we use the european model of cybersecurity management most effectively in our planning um if that is helpful so the so the european model any type of model right if that model is is going to give you some best practices or give you, uh, a, a, I always say, a, a posture that will be able to be flexible, a posture that will be able to help you assess the risks that are in your environment, right? Understand the threats that's in your environment, help you document those risks and threats so that you can put together a security plan that says how you're going to be protecting yourself, your organization, your end users, your client. Um, you, you know, as again, as a small business owner, you know what methods work for you. And if they have additional methods that's going to get you closer to your, your goals for cybersecurity, then I, I'm, I'm all for it, right? But also understanding that with anything, any of the methods that's out there, a lot of, a lot of the risks and threats that are pertinent to your business, you have to make sure that you're capturing that as well. There's overarching things that we can all put in place, but then there are specific things that you know as the, the, the business leader or owner 
that it's very important for you to protect for your infrastructure. So making sure that that's documented as well, making sure that you are testing those plans. I've had organizations that say, oh, we have a plan, um, but we, we never used it. And the first thing I said, you don't even do, you can do a tabletop exercise. You can do, you know, an annual where you're going over like what will happen in the event of emergency. And these days, an event of emergency can happen in a blink of an eye, right? Every day, there is something else that's happening. And you'll, you'll see larger organizations said it was something as simple as someone didn't do this or someone didn't do that. And most of the time, it's probably because someone wasn't trained. So educate your end users. <laughs> um, how about this? How may we best engage the use of artificial intelligence in our annual cybersecurity training process as a small business? So because I'm in cyber and I'm and I'm also a technologist, I am totally I am totally for anything that you can use that will help enhance, I'm gonna use the word enhance, enhance your intelligence, right? The artificial intelligence is there to help enhance your intelligence. It's not to be used. In, 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 in route of you using your own intellect because you know better than any machine, than any device, than any application, than any tool that you can buy, what is the best way to protect you and your organization? However, comma dot, I will say this, artificial intelligence, um, I've seen people use it to be able to put together templates for a security plan, templates for incident response plan, and then they will take that plan and then they will customize that plan based on their organization needs, based on their um, potential threats and risks. So it doesn't circumvent your responsibility as a small business owner. It can be a great tool to help enhance either your information or give you some additional tools and techniques to be able to keep your specific customers happy and also keep you off the news. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> Okay, what are the best ways to learn how to catalog our technological assets in terms of the levels of exposure risk as a small business? So I always say start with your most critical critical items, right? You know more than anyone who's your most critical, um, what, what's, what's the most critical things in your infrastructure. Um, I had a leader one time that came to me and he's like, I'm trying to put together this list, if, if, uh, like, if something went down first, what would, what, would I, what would I want to come back up first? And I'm, I said to him, I said, only you can make that decision because you know better than anyone what, is the, what will be the most crucial thing that can happen, critical thing that is happening to your business in emergency. What is the first thing you want to um, bring up? It's no different than someone saying, I have something in my house. I have like maybe my passport, my birth certificate, and you put it in a, a fire safe, right? A waterproof fire safe. So in the event of an emergency, if, the, if there's a fire, if, you, if there's a flood, that those, those, those important documents are still protected. It's the same concept when you're thinking about critical assets for your business or critical assets for things in your own life, right? Take that same you know, um, method of thinking when you're thinking about your environment. So if it's your laptops, if you know that this particular laptop has all of my credit card information, my data. So this is the most critical one. I need to make sure that the patches are up to date. I need to make sure it has the most stringent security controls. I need to make sure that the, the, the users that are using this have the education they need for it. So those are the type of things that you just have to sit and make an assessment. So no different than how when you put together a business plan, you had a wonderful idea, and then you had to figure out funding. You had to figure out location, you have to figure out what insurance I need. Should I be an LLC? Should I be an S Corp, right? So depending on what you decided, what legal structure you decided, that's how you would put together the rest of the plan. It's the same concept when you're putting together a security plan and even taking that same security plan and turning it into training for your end users, it's that same concept. What is the first step to take if there is a breach? So depending on your environment, um, if you have, if you haven't put together an instant response plan, think it through with your leaders, think it through with your customers, think it through even with your end users, think about them in mind. If something happened today and I, and my systems were breached, who would be impacted, who would be affected and how soon would something need to be uh, brought back up 
and who will be the first people that I would need to call. We talked a little bit about this in the training. We used to have something in the, in the, in the Air Force called a recall roster. That recall roster had all of the, the phone numbers of the most important people that I need to call in case of an emergency. It's the same concept. A breach is nothing but another form of an emergency. Put together a list on who you would need to contact in the emergency. If there's a significant breach and you find out that maybe it's something that's not localized or maybe it's not some specific to your organization, there is a process that you can put in place. This is when we'll call law enforcement. This is when we have to maybe even get the FBI involved. Those are things that you will have to put together a plan to be able to assess when you will need to put those things in place and making sure that your end users, your customers, and even your, um, your employees understand what to do in the event of emergency. So this is why education is always better than a cure and prevention. <laughs> it's a preventative tool. <laughs> Um, what is the best way to be easily informed on system threats that you wouldn't have thought of normally to research? Are there well-known trusted blogs that discuss and point out those unknown vulnerabilities? So for me, I, I, I like Google. So Google, I put in Google alerts for certain things that I want information on, and it'll come to me either in a form of an email or it'll give me an update when there's something new about that particular topic. And then we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. This is where you can use that as an enhancement. It doesn't replace your intelligence, but it also can be used as an enhancement, right? They will also, that tool can also give you some additional best practices that may be specific to your industry. This is why I always say the most, the best form of defense that you can have is being an educated CEO, right? You have to understand the risk and threats for your environment, putting together a plan in place, and making sure that that plan does not just collect dust, that it's a living document that you are continuously updating and that you're getting the most you know, valuable information. Um, so that's one thing that I use. I use Google Alerts. Um, and then there's a plethora of information out there and um, that may be relevant to your industry. So any professional organizations or associations that are specific to maybe to your industry, they'll sometimes have information. Um, I also run a nonprofit. So um, my, one of my nonprofit association also has a lot of information because um, it's a trusted source. So I'm very big on trusted source because you have a lot of fake news and different type of, you know, propaganda that's being you know, placed on the Internet. So I use trusted source for my information. <laughs> so, again, I'm always about verifying and validating even information that you're given. Um, do you have more info on like a security checklist or something like that? And um, Catherine, if I'm not asking that correctly, please um, go ahead and drop another question in. So some of the links, and we'll send out the slide deck that has um, some of the links. Um, and then even on our website, Virginia SPDC, we have a lot of information um, from either previous webinars or even um, just some tips and tricks about you know what to do um, in the event of, of putting together like a security plan or a different checklist. And there are specific things that you need additional assistance for. We also have the help at SPDC. You can email at any time and then we can get you out in information if you want to even schedule maybe even a one-on-one -on -one to do a deeper dive. Because one thing about cybersecurity or even dealing with technology, it can be, it's different for everyone because everyone uses it differently and everyone has maybe a different mission or maybe something that they are trying to accomplish that may be different. There's some overarching things that are saying, but sometimes there are things that are just unique to you. Um, and so we're here to help you with that and navigate that as well. Um, let's see, uh, do you know what is happening with the AI data being inputted by end users? Are there any security concerns with asking sensitive but unclassified type of questions related to government work? So no, 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 no. You are never supposed to put any type of sensitive or classified information in an unknown trusted source. So I, I'm sure that whoever gave you the security clearance or information, I'm, I'm almost 99.9% .9 that that was definitely something that was probably addressed in either their cybersecurity education and training, that that is a no, no. Um, you can put in information about maybe how to get a template for maybe incident response, but I would not 
put my information, my sensitive classified information in an unknown trusted source. So although these are great tools and advancement to enhance our information and knowledge, again, if you don't take the time to read the terms of use, the privacy policies, they are using that data however they choose because it is you are willfully disclosing information to those portals. So definitely keep that in mind. So I would say, I would say no, no, no to putting any type of sensitive classified or any specific information about yourself or your industry in any unknown trusted source. If I don't, if that don't leave you with anything else, no. <laughs> That's a big, I wish I had a flag. No, no, no. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do it. Um, let's see. Um, is it okay to use this material to train my staff and employees? Um, yes, please. Do. That's the and is it purpose. okay to call on you? Of course it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. That is the, that is the purpose. I mean, again, this because this is my industry, I understand. But if you threw me into dentistry, I wouldn't know where to start, right? So this is why even as CEOs or small business leaders, I know our time, our time is money for us, right? So making this investment today and coming to this webinar and gathering this information is the first step. So any tips, any, uh, any information that you received here, that you want to put together your own PowerPoint, or if you put together a PowerPoint and you just want to shoot it to me and say, Kiana, can you look over this? Am I missing anything? Is there something specific I should be mentioning? We're here to help you to navigate this, right? So utilize the resources like ourselves, like some of the organizations that we talked about. That's what we're here for. So I understand that, you know, I, I can't do surgery in a day by just, you know, attending one webinar, right? I wish it, it worked that way, but that's why some people have eight years that they went out to become these wonderful brain surgeons, right? And the information may be available. And although WebMD may be a great tool in enhancement, it does not <laughs> constitute a diagnosis outside of a, a physician. It's the same concept. Is it safe to assume that the NIST framework and regulations are suitable for use in small business networks? So those are... Yes, but again, they may be very stringent and not necessarily, you may not get to use all of them just for your specific industry, right? So if you only have two users, you know, and you maybe you're only processing credit cards, pull out the information that is relevant to your organization, to your end users, to your customers, right? Take it as a baseline, because that's what it is. It's usually a baseline to be able to give you some best practices, to be able to create a framework, to be able to put together a unique plan that is specific to you, your industry as that small, in that particular small business. So don't spend a lot of time and effort. If it doesn't apply, you don't necessarily have to do that as well, right? Those are just best practices. And you're like, well, I, I don't have to do that part. You know, I'm already doing this part. And maybe budget may say, Maybe quarter one, I can do this. And then quarter two, I can do that, right? It could be something that you have to work up to as well. Uh, my clients ask me if my information is secure. How can I assure them that I am taking the proper steps to ensure that the information they are sending me is secure? So again, you can put together maybe a one pager on how you protect their data, how you protect your data, um, what things you have in place. Maybe you have a firewall. Maybe you use a multi-factor authentication. Those are security controls. You can put together and say, I do uh, initial um, cybersecurity training for my end users. Um, I have laptops that have this form of encryption. I use this type of website. It has the SSL encrypt. It's, it's, it has encryption on it as well. Um, this is how I utilize data. This is my data protection policy. Uh, the more information that you can show your customers to give them that warm and fuzzy about your best practices and how you're implementing cybersecurity uh, best practices for their for, for their organizational needs and then also how you're handling it within your own organization. I think educating them as well um, and keeping the conversation. And then also sometimes you can even go to your client and say, 
how can we better serve you um, by putting certain things in place? And they could maybe say, well, maybe we, we would prefer that you use um, multi-factor authentication versus you know us using longer passwords. It could just be something as simple as that. So keeping the conversation going, it's like cybersecurity is a point in time, it's constantly changing and you have to stay on top of it because it's always evolving. All right, that's all the questions right now. We do have a few more minutes. If anyone else has a question they would like to drop into the Q&A, um, I know Kiana will be happy to answer. Yes, I love this. Keep them going. <laughs> this is how we keep the conversation and we even right. understand from you how we can better get information to you so that we can have a secure, critical infrastructure. That is our goal. <laughs> and Kiana, you've had quite a few people thank you for the information you provided and the questions you have answered. And thank I'll you. share those with you too after. Um, all right. Let's so again, see. that's our contact information. We'll send out the slides. Yes. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can always email me directly or you can email help at spdc.com. And then dot, also- dot org. Dot org, I'm sorry, dot org. <laughs> Then I knew I saw dot org in my head and then <laughs> came out. Um, and then there's also a link to some webinars that were either past webinars that we've had or even future webinars. So please, you know, keep the conversation going. We're going to have some great programming. Also in the month of October, I talked about Cybersecurity Awareness Month that's coming up. So take advantage of any events um, that you can attend. You know, an hour of your time may call may may, may mean millions of dollars in you securing yourself, your infrastructure, and even your clients. So we had another question drop in as well as some more thank yous. Um, <laughs> the question is for my company, I rely heavily on external data sources such as Square for payments. I have researched them and they have really good, uh, really great credentials. If yes. there was a data breach on their end, how would I assure them that the issue is being addressed when using a third party? So if there was a third party on, on from with you to them, is that the question? Yeah, let's see. Uh, they're using external external data sources uh, such as Square for payments. So I guess if Square has a data breach, uh, they're wondering how they can assure their customer that the issue is being addressed because it's not, because a third party is the one addressing you know the breach. So the, the best thing you can do is it, keep informing your, your customer about what's going on with the breach because as information becomes available, um, they Square or, who, or whoever the third party uh, the third, part, third party vendor will probably put out information. Usually when there's a breach of some sort, we've all had it happen where something happened. I remember like maybe a few years ago when Equifax had that big breach and you got a, something in the mail that told you exactly what was happening with the breach you know, what steps to take um, for anyone who had to go and probably do something like um, uh, order a new uh, um, credit report and then make sure that there was anything on your credit report. So if there are things that are happening and you have access to the information and you can see like maybe there wasn't something that happened on your end that your credit cards wasn't leaked um, and then even having a, a way to be able to handle that. We talked about with incident response if you have a rep for your third party application, like forming a relationship with that vendor so that you can have somebody that you can call. Um, most third party applications also either either have like a email address or even a phone number that you can call so that you can get the most up to date information. So you're not waiting for maybe snail mail to come out or for them to make a, a big announcement. So, you know, talking kind of that through how you will be able to handle that or what things you want to have in place in the event that something happens. Um, I always say prevention is better than a cure. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions we have right now. Um, got about five more minutes. So if anyone else has, I'll give you all a second to type them in. So, you know, so I, I hope that you take advantage of the information that was provided today and um, put together, you know, your first cybersecurity education and training program uh, for you and your end users. Uh, and even if it's just yourself, like I've had this owner say, well, it's just me. So even if it's just you, you know, putting together how you would deal with something in the event of an emergency. 
um, very similar to how you would deal with events in your own life. Who will be the first person you will call? Who, what are the critical items? And then having that listed out, right? Because even, I, even we recently had a flood at our um, location. And what was really helpful to even the insurance adjuster is that we had a list of all of our devices. We had the makes, the model, we had the year it was purchased. He's like, wow, you guys had this well documented. And I said, because we understand that, you know, in the area that we're at sometimes there's, you know, floods and things have happened in the past. We wasn't always that prepared, but what happened is that sometimes life happens, things happen. And then after an incident happens, then we always want to take the approach of being, you know, I'm going to make sure that never happens again. So if you can prevent something before that, and not waiting till something happens, but even if something does happen, taking the initiative to put something together, at the, at, like doing an after action report. And that was one of the things that came up from us when the first incident happened was we needed to have something in place that if something happened, that we had that information readily available. And it wasn't still at the same location that we had the flood at. So it was easy to get to that information and we were able to be able to get that to the insurance adjuster. So, you know, it can be something as simple as that. Okay, well, we've had nothing else drop in. So I think I'll wrap us up. Uh, Kiana, thank you so much. Thank you, um, thank you. And I wanna thank everyone for attending today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to the recording and to the slides, and it'll go out by early next week, possibly sooner. Um, if you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. This webinar and other SBDC resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. We hope to see you at our next session. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.